In the last episode, we looked at the magical structure of human consciousness. The second of the five structures which Sean Gebser examines within the pages of the ever-present origin. Here, we will now move on to the third structure of consciousness, the mythical structure, in which we will see the emergence of two-dimensional or polar consciousness. Within the emergence of mythical consciousness, the point-like unity of the magical structure divides and expands to become a polar modality of consciousness. Unlike the modality of dualism or contradiction, which is native to the fourth mental structure of consciousness, mythical polarity is consciousness which expresses itself both in binary opposition as well as in the continuity, reflectivity, and union of such opposition. As such, the primary symbolic motif of the mythical structure is found to be the circle, or mandala. The line which connects the two poles of a binary opposition bend back upon themselves so as to reconnect with one another and thereby assume a form which also expresses the cyclical periodicity with which the mythical structure is able to understand time. This mode of consciousness is perhaps expressed most vividly by the image of the Taiji Tu. The poles of yin and yang do not negate one another, as would be the case in the mode of mentalistic contradiction but rather complement, reflect, and interweave with one another. Rather than being mutually exclusive, we instead find that the opposing poles ontologically precondition one another. Yin counterbalances Yang, as Yang counterbalances Yin, and the two modalities are seen to invigorate one another, to emerge from within one another, and to interweave with one another. Just as the magical structure was a coming to awareness of nature, the mythical structure can be seen as a coming to awareness of time and of the human soul. A co-emergence which, for Gebser, indicates a deep affinity between the two concepts. The previous structure of magical consciousness was, in its earlier forms, directed backwards or downwards towards the primordial powers of the cavern, the womb, and the undifferentiated oneness of archaic consciousness. In its efforts to both control and individuate itself from nature, however, magical consciousness would eventually begin to direct itself upward, towards the heavens, the sky, the soul, and the transcendental. It is within this upward turn that mythical consciousness would begin to emerge. Human beings would begin to use their knowledge of the celestial periodicities, and thus knowledge of seasonal and lunar cycles, to achieve agricultural production. Humanity came to wield the powers of the celestial realm against the tumultuous primality of nature from which humanity had emerged, and which ever threatened to devour or re-engulf humanity. The power of order, correlated with the sky, became juxtaposed with the chaotic, vitalizing powers of life which were felt to emanate from the ocean or from the underworld which lay beneath the terrestrial realm. Thus the polarity of the above and below came to constitute the center of the emerging mythical consciousness within humanity. We see this archetypal dynamic play out within numerous myths throughout human cultures, and here we will look to the creation myth of ancient Sumer so as to illustrate some of the most significant and ubiquitous motifs which are expressive of mythical consciousness.
Sumerian myth tells of a time before the existence of the earth or sky in which the deities Abzu and Tiamat remained co-mingled within the underworld of Irkala. Abzu was the god of fresh water and the consort of Tiamat, the goddess of salt water. Order and chaos were thus undifferentiated within this primal oneness. And from this commingling of order and chaos, of seminal and gestating powers, the first generation of younger deities would be born. These younger gods would eventually come to murder Abzu in order to usurp his powers, the powers of order. And in her rage at this transgression, Tiamat would give birth to monstrous dragons or demons, beings which would strive to destroy the creations of the younger gods. The god Enlil, the great-grandchild of Abzu and Tiamat, would then use the powers of Abzu to divide heaven from earth and thereby condition the possibility of terrestrial existence and thus human existence. The younger gods would then war against the monsters of Tiamat until eventually the god Marduk, a god of rulership and sovereign order, would come to slay Tiamat by trapping her with a net and piercing her belly with an arrow. Following this victory, the younger gods would come to defeat the monsters which plagued the world which they had created, and Marduk would come to found the first city of Eridu, thereby bringing human civilization into existence. With the primeval state of Abzu and Tiamat being unified before the creation of the world, we see a signification of the archaic consciousness structure, with its nature of undifferentiated identity. The myth alludes to a primordial state in which order and chaos, yang and yin, masculine and feminine, light and darkness, were as yet undivided. Fresh water falls from the sky as rain, and the water of rivers descends in altitude as it approaches the sea. Recall that it was the power of Abzu, of fresh water, which the younger gods sought to wield. Therefore the powers wielded consciously by the younger gods, and thus the power of the sky and celestial realm, is the power of fresh water, of order or yang, while their unconscious qualities derive from their heredity, which derives from the great mother Tiamat as much as from the masculine Abzu. Just as the sky and fresh water are seen to be of a realm which transcends the earth, the powers of salt water are seen to be of the ocean which resides below the earth. And the underground lakes of fresh water which remain in caverns beneath the earth are understood to be a vestige of a state of undifferentiated oneness before the creation of the world. From this power of fresh water, of Yang, is then derived the power of rulership wielded by the god Enlil, a god of the sky and storms, much like the Proto-Indo-European Dias, the Hellenic Zeus, or the Roman Jupiter. This power of rulership is then utilized to differentiate heaven and earth. Light and darkness are separated, and the earth thereby comes into being. This power of rulership is then wielded by Marduk, who uses it to slay Tiamat and thereby quell the powers of chaotic, primal violence and frenzy which threaten the existence of humanity. This power is then used to create human civilization, signifying the emergence of mythical consciousness from the magical structure, and signifying the achievement of humanity's separation from nature. This myth illustrates that the power which liberated humanity from nature was derived from the heavens, 
and further illustrates the polarity of mythical thinking. The polarity of fresh water and salt water, like that of yang and yin, is fundamental to the ontology depicted by the myth itself and can be seen as an underlying motif which gives shape to the narrative which unfolds from the myth's initial cosmogony. In separating ourselves from nature, from the Great Mother, humanity looked to the heavens as a source of power by which humanity could establish an order which would be independent of nature, and which would allow humanity to safeguard itself from the powers of nature which assailed us, and which threatened our existence and security. In looking to the heavens, humanity began to become aware of the cyclical periodicity of time, and also began to experience our own existence in a novel manner which was closely associated with the powers of the heavens. If transcendental, celestial order is that which gives shape to the world and allows for the continuity of its existence, then such order, such form, might also be seen as fundamental to our own existence. As we saw earlier, within the bounds of the magical structure, human self-identity remained in some sense distributed, collective, and tribal. With the emergence of the mythical structure of consciousness, the sense of human self-identity came to contract and consciousness of the celestial realm allowed for the possibility of an identity which not only separated human beings from nature, but also separated human beings from one another. Individual personhood came to being. Human beings came to see that some aspect of our being was celestial in its essence. Unlike the sense of self which derived from our origination in the natural world around us, the mythical sense of the self was seen to be something which transcended our embodied, familial, genealogical, and ecological relationships. We came to see our identity as being more than what we were in relation to our tribe or to the great mother goddess. Like all things within the scope of mythical consciousness, the human soul came to be revealed as a polarity of transcendent and imminent, of the above and the below. Within the ever-present origin, Jean Gebser illustrates this polarization in terms of what he denotes as the life soul and the death soul. The life soul refers to the imminent aspect of human identity. It is affiliated with the element of water and with the powers of the moon. This valence of the soul is a self-identity understood in the embodied terms of blood relations, social relations, and felt emotions. The life soul is one's actual embeddedness within and interweaving with the natural world. It is our participation within the world. It is our felt sense of presence within the world, and it is our sense of the vital forces within us which sustain us within and against the world. It is what we are in a clearly experiential, manifest, and mortal sense. The danger and challenge presented by the life soul is akin to that of the ocean. Our life soul originates from the oceanic womb of undifferentiated life power, which is the natural world. And if we are unable to maintain ourselves against the onslaught of such natural powers, we may become subsumed pulled back down by gravity into the abyss from which we once emerged. In myth, therefore, the human quest to master the life soul and preserve it 
is depicted as the struggle of human beings to survive and master the sea. This motif can be found within Homer's Odyssey or within the various flood myths found throughout various cultural traditions. We also see this motif within the Greek depiction of the afterlife, as five rivers are said to flow through the cavernous underworld of Hades. These rivers are considered to serve the purpose of purifying or purging the soul, as well as guiding it along the path through the afterlife and on to its reincarnation. The death soul, conversely, is the form which facilitates our differentiation from the world and from one another, and it is that which allows for a continuity of that differentiation. Just as the patterns of the astronomical realm give shape to the seasons and other processes of life which we experience within the terrestrial realm, the death soul is seen as a transcendental form which becomes manifest within the body and within the world, rather than being the imminence of our existence itself. The death soul is associated with the element of air and with the sun. The death soul is expressed in terms of prana and pneuma the breath of life which enters into the body and thereby animates the body. Yet just as breath leaves the body, so does the death soul. It is exhaled and thereby released from the body, no longer bound by gravity and thus able to rise upwards, taking flight towards the realm of its essence, the celestial realm. Like the celestial bodies which persist independently of the chaotic transfigurations of birth, death, and rebirth which characterize the terrestrial realm, the death soul is also seen as having an existence which is independent of the body and its vital forces. The death soul is life transcending, and thus is an aspect of one's being which is believed to survive bodily death. Just as the danger of the life soul is its subduction and dissolution within the vital forces of nature, the danger of the death soul is in its ascent, a motif we see clearly expressed within the Greek myth of Icarus. Failing to heed the warnings of his father Daedalus, Icarus flies too close to the burning light of the sun, representing the death soul, and is ultimately destroyed by the radiance of the sun. If the life soul is characterized by one's connections to the world, then the death soul is that which separates and distinguishes an individual from the world and from other individuals. As such, ambition, selfishness, arrogance, and pride, forces which disconnect the individual from others, may result in the death soul becoming perilously untethered from the world or from others. As previously indicated, the growing awareness of human self-identity within the mythical structure was directly correlated with a growing awareness of time. And just as mythical awareness of soul is polar in nature, so too is time experienced as a polarity. Just as the death soul was experienced as an inextricably polar contrast with the life soul, so too the mythical awareness of periodic time was experienced as a polar contrast with timelessness. Time emerges within the mythical structure not as the spatialized, sequential time of the mental structure, but rather as a cyclical periodicity which accords with the astronomical processions which mythical consciousness directed itself towards. The duality of time and timelessness, of becoming and being, interweaves and interpenetrates, manifesting itself as the meaning-laden, cyclical recurrences of the world. Periodic time stands in polar contrast with timelessness. 
A great many myths can perhaps best be understood as eternal events. Such events do not occur in historical time, as the mental structure would understand such a notion, but rather are events which, in their essence, continually recur within the periodic cycles of time. Pain is continually slaying Abel, with each instance of fraternal betrayal and resentment-fueled violence. Odysseus is continually setting upon his quest at sea, with each cycle of psychological individuation which requires us to venture into the unknown. Time can thus be understood as the playing out of the timeless, and the timeless can be seen as that which gives shape to time. Both poles condition the existence of the other, and the world is understood to be an enactment of the creative interplay of their opposition, as is the case for all such mythical polarities. Just as dreams speak for the unconscious of an individual person, myths articulate the dreams of the collective unconscious. They are the dreams not of individuals, but of a people. As with all dreams, myths are understood to be the communion between the living realm of temporal flux and the timeless realm of the dead and of the eternal. Within mythical consciousness, we see that the unitary magical emphasis upon the power of the womb-like cavern mutates into a clear polarity of masculine and feminine iconotypes which we see given expression within architectural forms. Greek columns, phallic in nature, gesture towards the sky, invoking significations of seminal potency, as well as the soul's individuation from the primordial womb. In contrast, the natural cavern becomes the similarly womb-like adytum of the Greek temple. We see within these architectural forms an instantiation of the mythical life world as a whole. Supported by their foundation upon the feminine earth, the phallic columns are able, through the cooperation of their multiplicity, to support the ceiling, the civic institutions of the social edifice. The architectural structure thus achieved thereby shelters and contains the inner sanctum of the temple, the womb-like adytum which signifies the primordial powers of feminine vitality. This feminine power of the womb is now understood to be in need of protection from the chaotic powers of nature which might assail it. Within every detail of such architectural forms, we see expression of the underlying mythos which gives shape to the social world out of which such architecture was created. The mythic structure, of course, did not simply die away following the end of the classical era, nor with the birth of modernity and the rise of our purportedly secular age. We can see that mythical iconography has not simply atrophied, but rather has continued to mutate along with the ever-changing shape of human consciousness. The Greco-Roman forms of architectural iconography would eventually come to mutate into the great spires of Christian cathedrals. No longer pillars supporting a ceiling or social life world, the Gothic spires instead gesture towards heaven as a singular impulse towards transcendence. As the central focal point of such Christian architecture, this will to transcendence expressed by the spire is indicated to be that which gives shape to the architectural form of the cathedral as a whole. This unitary aspiration is therefore that which gives shape to the order of the whole of the social body, to the Christian life world itself. The Gothic spires of the medieval age would then become the towers of the Enlightenment and of modernity. London's Big Ben, rather than expressing the medieval aspiration towards salvation through transcendence, 
instead expresses the power of masculine rationality expressed by the clock face to achieve the systematized, disciplined, and mechanistic order of modernity. We see the most recent expression of this mythical iconography within the titanic, monumental rockets of our own technological age. The Saturn V craft, which I personally see every day on my commute to work here in Huntsville, Alabama, is a particularly pronounced example of this iconographical form. Within such monuments, we see an expression of a will to transcendence, which has become fully enraptured by the powers of mechanistic science and engineering a will which looks to abdicate itself fully from its binding to the earth and to the past. It is a will which sees transcendence not as releasement from egoic ambition, as was the case of the Christian mythos, but rather as the ultimate achievement of such ambition. The Saturn V is not rooted in the earth but rather terminates in titanic thrusters, which intend to free us from the limitations of the earth and of the past. This is a mythos of technological and progressivist liberation, and one which is rapidly becoming a mythos of transhumanism. Liberation not only from the dogmas and customs of the past, but further a liberation from the necessities and limitations of the human form itself. Once again, we see the powers of the heavens, now understood to be the powers of scientific reason, used as a spear with which we might slay the goddess Tiamat, whose powers of vital, embodied physicality lay beyond our control and which threaten the possibilities of our transcendental aspirations. The transcendence aspired to by the age of scientific triumph is a freedom to be untethered from the earth as we know it, and free to explore the great cosmic ocean of the stars. It is not that we have abandoned the mythical in favor of the scientific, but rather it is that our unconscious mythos has become a scientific mythos. As always, previous consciousness structures are not simply overcome or surpassed, but instead come to manifest through a kind of pseudomorphosis, as they come to manifest through successive structures. As always, the more that such structures of our consciousness remain unconscious, the less within our power they remain, and the more vulnerable we may be to exploitation through the manipulation of such structures. Mythical motifs are omnipresent throughout the national, social, and political narratives of our modern world. Oftentimes these motifs are intentionally engineered so as to act upon the occluded, mythical structure of our consciousness. Yet it is equally common, if not even more common, for such mythical themes to emerge organically, as narratives develop and circulate through the metabolic currents of our media ecology. Ways of framing or languaging certain narratives or issues may activate our mythical sensibilities without our conscious awareness and therefore such mutations of narrative come to gain more traction and inertia within the media sphere. As momentum and proliferation compound, so do such mutations, and narratives thus achieve a mythical character which resonates with the primordial myths which we harbor beneath the surface of our immediate awareness. In the words of Carl Jung, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will rule your life and you will call it fate. 
It may also then be said that if the dynamics of the collective unconscious are not brought to our awareness, then they will rule the destiny of our civilization, and we will call it the end of the world. And that's going to be a wrap for this week. Thank you so much for your time. If you'd like to subscribe, I'd very much appreciate it, as I'm going to keep these videos coming as regularly as possible. And I've got a whole bunch of obscure-ish topics I'm planning to cover in as much detail as possible. Of course, let me know in the comments if you've got any thoughts you'd like to share, and I'll be back with another video next week. Once again, thanks for watching.